live. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nitin Nani. I'm a 3L and the president for Cornell Law's Federal Society chapter. I'm honored to serve as the host for this latest installment of the PG-15 Study Break series featuring the Federal Society's 15 practice groups. Before we get things started, I do want to emphasize this is an opportunity for audience members to ask questions, and you can do so through the chat function on Zoom. The Federal Society's 15 practice groups are organized by substantive areas of law. Each practice group is led by a chairman and executive committee comprised of top lawyers from across the country. They meet each month to organize in-person events, webinars, publications, and the panels for the Federal Society's flagship event, the National Lawyers Convention. You can learn more about the practice groups at fedsoc.org slash practice groups. So tonight's after Fed will focus on criminal law and procedures practice group, and we're excited to speak with Zach Terrilla Gur. Zach is a former Senate confirmed U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, and he has extensive experience in all manners of federal investigations and trials. His career began as an office intern, and back then, being a U.S. Attorney seemed like an ambitious dream. Zach then graduated from the University of Virginia and earned his JD at William and Mary School of Law, after which he clerked on the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida, worked as an assistant U.S. Attorney, and served as majority counsel to the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and as both Associate Deputy Attorney General and Chief of Staff to the Deputy Attorney General, whose office manages the entire Department of Justice and its various agencies. Upon being confirmed and sworn in, Zach was the then youngest U.S. attorney in the country and supervised a team of over 300 lawyers and support staff. He now works as a partner at Vincent and Elkins Washington, D.C. office, guiding clients through internal and government investigations, allegations of bribery under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and criminal grand jury matters, among other complex white collar issues. Zach, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks so much for having me, Ned, and thanks to the Federal Society for making this possible. So. I'm going to get started um, tonight by asking you, um, within the realm of public service, what are common paths for federal criminal practice? Sure. So um, when I was an assistant United States attorney and getting a lot of reach out from friends and colleagues who wanted to become prosecutors, you know, there's generally three paths into the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Department of Justice, which is generally where, unless you're at the state or local level, um, you know, federal criminal practice really, really exists and thrives. And one is um, through the DOJ Honors Program. So for those of you currently in law school, um, you can apply, you know, during your 3L year, or you can apply coming out of a, a clerkship. Those are the two times that you're eligible. And that's a program by which various sections in DOJ hire lawyers um, into the honors program. There's generally a four-year commitment. Um, and that's a great way to get a jump start and get right into the department straight out of law school. Um, the second way is um, you go to a big law firm, um, you learn great habits and you train under people. And oftentimes if you're in um, a white collar or white collar adjacent practice, you work with a former AUSA or US attorney or DOJ trial lawyer, and that person mentors you, takes you under their wing. And then when it comes time that you want to go into government, you've got someone who can vouch for you. And then third, um, some people go the DA route or in Virginia, we call them Commonwealth attorneys or assistant commonwealth attorney, you get a tremendous amount of trial practice um, very early in your career, um, and you're on your feet, you know, day in, day out um, as a DA or an assistant DA. Those are generally the three paths into um, a U.S. attorney's office or the Department of Justice um, if you're going on a career route. Obviously, if you're seeking a political appointment, um, even at, you know, a, a more um, lower level position that doesn't require Senate confirmation, you know, that, that's a different approach. But um, generally, those are the those are ways I've seen it. There's there's no one size fits all. But I would tell you if it's something that you're interested in doing in terms of public service and specifically being a criminal prosecutor or a trial lawyer, um, certainly taking those opportunities um, to do externships, internships um, and letting that interest be known because. Generally, there's, you know, hundreds, if not in some cases, a thousand applications for every position. And uh, being someone who's reviewed a lot of those applications, you really want to see a commitment um, to public service rather than just somebody who's going through a box checking exercise. And that's really helpful to know. And I think you touched on this a little bit. I mean, I'm hoping you could elaborate more on um, the differences kind of between career and political appointees and government positions. And 
um, I guess, some of the opportunities in the political realm as well? Sure. Um, it's a great question. So I was fortunate enough to, uh, well, let me just say this, um, 93 U.S. attorney's offices across the country, one for each federal district. And um, as a result, the only political appointee in those offices is the, the U.S. attorney. So those are apolitical, all career positions. At Maine Justice, um, certainly at the White House and elsewhere, there are a lot of legal positions that can involve criminal practice and criminal procedure. Um, and those are what we call Schedule C appointments. And so, you know, for every principal position that may require Senate confirmation, there's usually three or four or five staff positions. And so one of the jobs that I had um, at the Department of Justice on the transition team, which was, you know, we basically came in on January 20th after the president was sworn in and you stand up government was interview a lot of people for those positions. And, and generally, um, you know, you're, you've got someone who's vouching for you and someone who's pushing for you. And, and I will say, you know, my, my longtime connection to the federal society is very helpful there because it's a network that um, uh, administrations turn to, um, to fill, fill the ranks. And so, you know, those positions are, are, you know, very competitive and there's a lot of interest, but frankly, if you're somebody um, who who expresses an interest, and certainly if you're affiliated with a principal, whether that be a law firm partner, a, a professor, a judge, et cetera, um, who's being asked for their opinion, or perhaps they're even going in as the confirmed um, principal, it's a great way to get in um, one of those positions. And the advice I give a lot of people is get in the door. Um, I know so many people that started working on issues they weren't particularly interested in or started at a lower level. But once you get in, then it really does become a meritocracy and the cream rises to the top. And, you know, the hard part is, is getting your foot in the door. And once you're there, you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah, that, that's great advice. And, you know, I know that our listeners appreciate you know, hearing that. Um, could you talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day work and what that's like for federal prosecutors? Sure. Um, so I spent uh, almost a decade as a as a what we call a line assistant, assistant United States attorney. And, you know, I think if you talk to a lot of people, certainly myself included, but people who've had far more illustrious careers than than I have, um, they will say the happiest and most fun they ever had was as an assistant United States attorney. And, you know, day in, day out, what you're really doing is running investigations and manning, managing cases. And that's interesting because it's one of the things law school does not prepare you for. Uh, but you're working with investigative agents. And it's really at this point, a symbiotic relationship. The days of you investigate, we prosecute are really over. So when you're running, for example, a grand jury investigation, you're working with those agents in terms of who are we going to interview? Who are we going to put in the grand jury? What records do we need? And there's nothing more exciting and rewarding than putting a case together, whether that be a violent crime case where you're, you know, um, achieving justice on behalf of a victim, or, you know, one of the cases that was most meaningful that I worked on was a Ponzi scheme that defrauded um, a bunch of teachers who had put their entire life savings um, into a scheme. And, and, you know, what you're really doing is you're 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 progressing forward in an investigation, you're making judgment calls, you're spending a lot of time talking to people. Um, you're talking to witnesses, you're talking to detectives, you're talking to potentially to subjects in a proper situation where you're bringing people in and explaining how you think, you know, you basically have the entire case built and really what you want them to do is plead and cooperate and make your case stronger. Um, and so it's, it's one of the most exhilarating and rewarding jobs um, that I've ever had. It is a tremendous amount of work. I think a lot of people think of being a lawyer in the government as a nine to five with every other Friday off and, um, you know, federal Fridays and those sorts of things. Th those legal jobs may exist. I I've never had one. And anyone who's a prosecutor or a trial attorney will tell you, you know, they're working just as hard as those in private practice for, you know, a fraction uh, of the money. So you obviously don't do it to get rich. It's incredible experience and it's, it's greatly rewarding, but it is a tremendous amount of work. Um, and I would, I mean, one thing I think back on is my first year as a prosecutor, I worked every weekend except for two. And um, that was just the norm because there was such a learning curve. I really appreciate hearing that. And I think the audience will need to hear a little bit about your specific experiences. Um, could you speak about your experience prosecuting you know, some of the gruesome MS-13 cases in Northern Virginia? And you know, what are the challenges you know, you're dealing with when you're taking on a gang like MS-13? Sure. Um, th thanks for that question. Yeah, some of my my proudest moments were prosecuting Morris Alatrucha 13. For those who aren't aware, it's a 
the very violent um, El Salvadorian gang was originally started um, in California and then um, and, and actually was brought from California down to what we call the Northern Triangle countries, um, predominantly in El Salvador and Honduras and a little bit in Guatemala. And um, I actually started my career as what's called a project safe neighborhood prosecutor, which meant guns and gangs. And in Northern Virginia, it was MS-13. And um, really, really interesting, tragic cases. In many, many instances, you just have extreme violence um, being being levied upon um, some of the most vulnerable in society. Um, and some of those cases that I, basically I worked on a lot of truly violent crime, machete attack type cases, drive-by shooting type cases. Um, and then the gangs started to engage in human trafficking. And so for about two years, I was a human trafficking prosecutor and these were, um, you know, going to be graphic for a second. These were sex trafficking cases of minors um, as young as 12. And, and I tell you what, you know, I, I feel like I have met evil incarnate in some of the people that I prosecuted. I mean, to to sexually traffic um, a 12 year old girl was just um, beyond horrific. And so those cases were incredibly difficult. There's obviously, uh, well, and maybe not obviously, but a lot of the communications would be in Spanish. So that adds a wrinkle. Um, you're often using translators in court um, and there's you know certain dialect that you're trying to crack through. There's also a code that anyone who cooperates the gang gets killed. Um, there is also threats made against judges and prosecutors and witnesses. And that adds a whole different dynamic, um, threats against jurors. And so those, those were incredibly difficult cases. Um, and those are cases where you know your witnesses really do feel like you know, they're between the proverbial rock and a hard place because if they cooperate against the gang, it can be a death sentence for them or their family, um, including family members back in El Salvador where, you know, there there isn't the protection of U.S. law enforcement like there would be here. So th those were incredibly meaningful, difficult, impactful cases. Um, and I do feel like there were, th that's, that's a good example of where federal law enforcement is needed. Obviously in the federal society, we, we obviously believe in robust state government, but when you're talking about trying to take on an international street gang that's crossing county lines, crossing state lines, crossing international lines, and you need, um, you need both the detectives, um, in, in those cases, I worked with Fairfax County detectives who are some of the best investigators I've ever worked with, but you also need the resources of the FBI um, in terms of linguistics, in terms of you know document processing, in terms of the ability um, to put people in the witness protection program um, and, and things of that nature. So yeah, th those, I mean, I could, I could tell stories about those cases um, all evening because they were some of the most meaningful. No, and it's really fascinating to hear about you know, the different experiences you've had, and we appreciate you sharing with you know those with us. Um, Based on those, what advice or suggestions would you give to aspiring federal prosecutors? Like, in your view, what makes a successful federal prosecutor? Sure. I, you know, look, I think there's a lot of different types of lawyers out there. For those of you who are, well, all of you, anyone who's a lawyer or spent time in and around the law know, I mean, you have your extremely bright um, Supreme Court clerk um, type lawyers. You have your um, trial lawyers who are in there day in, day out, um, performing in front of a jury. And, and it really can take all types. I, I don't think there's one model that makes a successful prosecutor. Um, if you're lucky enough, I actually used to work with a guy who, who had it all, um, Supreme Court clerk, first in his class, um, a tremendous charisma. I mean, and, and you know, there's those people, but for the rest of us mortals, um, you know, I think an important thing is you really, you got to have a passion to do the work. Um, and the people who go in to just get the experience, check the box, to go make partner in a law firm, or they, they're just, it takes so much of a commitment. And so what I would say is it's not something you want to enter into lightly. And, and look, let's be honest, you're taking people's liberty away. And that's something that the minute you forget that is the time to step away. Um, you know, there's certainly high-fiving that goes on. There's certainly hugs um, afterwards. And you know, um, celebrations when you get a victory um, because you're doing it on behalf of the crime victims, but you are taking someone's liberty away. And that, that's a real thing. And um, so I think, you know, to boil it down to a couple pieces of advice, I'd say, look, make sure you know what you're getting into. We did have certain people I worked with who weren't comfortable um, taking people's liberty away and they quickly left the office. So make sure you know what you're getting into. 
have a passion for it. And, and when you're in there, do it to the max, because that's what the American people expect. That's what, um, that's really what the job requires. And it's a really special opportunity. You, you know, one of the greatest things you'll hear assistant United States attorneys talk about is, you know, Zach Twilliger, half the United States, you're not, I mean, you're representing the United States. And the third thing is, um, you know, I think it, it really is paying attention to the details. You got to be very detail oriented. You've got to be very organized because it's a lot of times it's just you. You don't have a big team. It's not like in big law where I am now, where you have a team of associates watching your back and making sure, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Um, but if it's something that interests you, one of the things I would say is hold fast to that dream. Don't let go of it. And I have seen people apply six and seven times to be assistant United States attorneys. And maybe they didn't get their first choice and get to prosecute, you know, in the Eastern District of New York, but they started off prosecuting in some other district and made a name for themselves and then got on the radar and eventually worked up to the office they wanted to be in. Or they started out, you know, as a tax attorney, learned the ins and outs of putting together a document case and then moved over to the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act unit, not to pick on tax lawyers, but it is one of those things where if you if you have the drive um, and you're willing to put in the time, you can make it happen. It's it's not like, you know, maybe I want to be in the NFL and that was never going to happen from the moment I was born. If you want to be a federal prosecutor, um, hold fast to that dream, you'll get there. That's that's awesome advice. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, the differences between working, you know, as a federal prosecutor versus, you know, working at a big law firm. And you're now kind of doing white collar work at, a, you know, a big law firm. Um, what sort of skills are important to be successful in that sphere? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think it depends on what you're doing. I mean, look, my my hats off to big law associates. I'm sure some of you who are tuned in um, have worked as summer associates, um, and some of you may be in law school at night, and you're you know currently paralegals or, or law clerks at a firm. You know, to be a really successful associate, it means, you know, being incredibly disciplined, you know, the buck um, may stop with a partner, but ultimately you're the one who's who's holding that person up. Um, so it's being detail oriented, it's being organized, it's knowing when to ask questions, and it's really never mailing it in. I mean, mailing it in as an associate can be devastating to you personally and your reputation in a law firm, it can be devastating to a matter. Um, and, and so it's, it's really about, you know, bringing your A game each and every day. Um, you know, there's a saying that I don't subscribe to, you know, close enough for government work. There, there is something to be said when it's you and maybe a legal assistant and an agent and the detective where I think the court generally knows, like, there's a, a really high expectation that your work product's going to be perfect. But, you know, you bring in a search warrant and, you know, there's a typo. You bring in a search warrant and, and something's wrong or a criminal complaint. The magistrate judge is going to, you know, give you an earful and you're going to go back and fix it and come back. You know, in big law, there there is no room for error. I mean, you make a mistake like that in front of a client, you know, it can absolutely impact the client relationship. So I think attention to detail and, and making sure you're bringing your best every day in terms of what what makes a good partner. Um, I'll let others who have been doing it longer than I have um, opine on that. But I do think so much of being a lawyer in, in, and certainly in the white collar space in today's age is bringing in business. Um, and what that means is in white collar, we're, we're like oncologists. Nobody wants us until the really bad things happen and then they really need you. And as soon as it's over, um, they don't want to think about that time in their life again. You don't get a ton of repeat business in white collar. Um, and so it's, you really, you've got to have a high EQ, which uh, as, well, as well as a high IQ, because you're dealing with individuals um, going through some of the worst moments in their life, even if it's, you know, a company CEO or general counsel, and they didn't do anything wrong, but their company's being dragged through an investigation, share prices dropped, you know, got to fire employees. Um, so you really do have to have a high EQ to be able to do this work too. I think, you know, there are some lawyers out there that are still bomb throwers, flip the table over, everything scorched earth, move ahead. Um, you know, that may work for some. What I have seen is you really do need a soft touch and a good bedside manner around clients. Um, and, and that's really important. Yeah, that's, um, we appreciate that advice um, and those insights. So another question from the audience. Um, is it difficult to transition between government service and private practice or vice versa? And before you know, I have you answer, this is just a reminder to everybody that you can submit your questions through the chat function. 
Yeah, great question. I, you know, I think the way I'd caveat that is it, it, it all depends on what the transition is and what the timing is. I mean, I've I've witnessed people who have done it seamlessly, sort of float into administration, great job, float back, you know, to their partnership. Um, you know, some advice to the young folks or law students or, or young lawyers on is in going into government, it can get very difficult to transition in if you wait too long because you become more and more expensive. And what I mean by that is in these times of tight budgets, which I think we're always going to have in terms of um, legal slots, you know, you can only pay somebody so little. Like you, you get to a point where you're years out of law school, there's there's a band that they can pay you on, but you get more and more expensive. And so there were numerous times where I was a US attorney where I would hire, I'd be able to hire two people who were three or four years out of law school for one person who was 12 years out of law school. And so um, one thing that makes you uh, very attractive to a hiring authority is the less expensive you are. So that, that that'd be one piece of advice. In terms of transitioning, you know, from government, um, that's also a big timing issue. I mean, generally, you know, law firms, et cetera, you know, there's a window in which you can leave government. You either leave it um, and it's really easy and you're incredibly marketable and you kind of hit your stride or you can stay too long. Um, and so I do think that's one of those things if, if you do need to leave if financially or career wise, you don't want to be a lifer. Um, you know, you don't kind of want to get there and immediately feel like, you know, there's there's a clock ticking above you. But some advice I used to get was, you know, nose to the grindstone, but eyes on the horizon. And, and I do think, you know, you need to be mindful about your legal career. It's not as simple as it used to be to sort of float in and float out. And if you're going to take a political position, um, as we've seen, you know, that that comes with inherent risk. Um, you, you can be canceled. You can be someone who's not hireable. Um, you can be someone who's going to have to incur a lot of, you know, personal um, debt based on legal fees. And, and that's also the world we're living in now. So, you know, not to dissuade anybody from public service, but you should really go in eyes wide open. And there's a number of people who I know personally um, who who are have paid six figures, you know, out of their own pocket um, for legal representation just as witnesses um, because of some of the investigations that have gone on. Great. And I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about the practice group itself. Um, how long have you been involved in the practice group? So I was I was involved in the practice group for a while as an assistant United States attorney. And then I got really, really busy and sort of took a step back and then got involved now as a private practitioner um, for the last several years. And I would say my my participation has increased um, now that I'm I'm outside of government. Uh, and it's I will say it's you know, when you are billing hours, um, going through the grind of, you know, um, bringing in business and, and kind of jumping from matter to matter, it's been really nice to come together as a practice group and frankly talk about issues um, related to criminal justice. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not something you get to do day in, day out, and I probably took it for granted when I was in government. So it's nice to come together and talk through those things. And to be around individuals who are going to challenge your thinking and are at different places in their career. I and mean, there's a number of former government people in the uh, criminal law and practice procedure um, practice group. And, and that's been great because it's, it, it's like a built-in mentorship program. Um, and it's one of those Zoom invites now that I really look forward to once a month to hop on and talk through the latest Supreme Court case or the latest speech that a deputy attorney general just gave. Um, so it is, it, it's a great way to, to stay involved, especially if someone for like me who otherwise would sort of be all corporate all the time. Um, how can students and recent grads get involved in your practice group? Sure. So um, that's that one. I would I would absolutely kick um, to the Federal Society. I'm happy to be an ambassador for them, and happy to be someone who um, can really talk freely, openly, and and highly about my experience. But if that's something of interest to you, um, please reach out. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me, and I'll connect you with the right people. But you can also go um, to the Federal Society webpage and you know express your interest, get involved, um, and frankly. You know, I'm sure you all are deep in the outlining stages for those law students now. The fact that you're tuning in at, you know, 825, um, you know, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving says a lot. But 
stay involved. It's it's a really I I have found that it's been a great way um, to both expand your network, um, meet a lot of people who are outside of your particular geographic area, um, but also a great place for mentorship. Um, one of the most important mentors in my life I met um, after a federal society meeting, I just kind of tugged on his sleeve and said, you know, you've had one of the jobs I'd really want. Um, you know, would you be willing to have coffee with me? And it made a huge difference in my life. I do want to get to one question from the audience. Um, Christopher is asking, as a prosecutor, how did you handle or respond to political pressure, particularly in high profile cases, um, given that public discourse has increasingly viewed criminal prosecutions rather through a political lens? Yeah, it's a great question, Christopher. And, um, you know, it's interesting. That was something as an assistant United States attorney, you didn't have to deal with. As a U.S. attorney, it was something you dealt with constantly. And um, it's funny you bring that up. I was actually in an um, interview for a new piece of work yesterday, and someone asked me a very similar question. And I said, well, look, to me, it's not a hypothetical because it's happened. And um, the Eastern District of Virginia, where I was fortunate enough to serve, has a lot of high profile cases um you know we um chelsea manning was you know held in contempt of court um for many months um because of her refusal to cooperate while i was u.s attorney and there was protesters you know, outside the courthouse and all, all sorts of things like that and so the bottom line is as i'm sure you've heard from others is it's at those moments where you really just have to adhere to the law and adhere to the facts um and i I made a deal with myself pretty early on that if I felt like something was being done for political reasons, I'd resign. I wouldn't go out there and cloak myself in self-righteousness and leak and, you know, make a big thing of it. I just would make it very clear that, you know, we are not going to do things based on politics while I'm the U.S. attorney. You know, if I'm asked to do that, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, I'll resign and, you know, you can, you can move on. And so I, I'm grateful that it never came to that. Um, there were multiple discussions I had through my time as U.S. attorney where um, politics were, you know, mentioned and, you know, one real easy way to shut it down. And, and, and frankly, when you look at your troops in the eye and say, we're always going to do the right thing, one of the easiest ways to do that is say, look, we're going to apply the lot of the facts and, and that's how we're going to proceed. And, and that is something that's great about the Department of Justice with this. Whereas if you follow that ethos, um, you're always going to be protected. You may not be popular. It may cost you your job, but you know, you're always going to do the right thing. I think that's great advice. Um, I see we're running a little bit low on time, but as this is a study break, um, I did want to end with a fun question for you. Um, what did you enjoy doing in law school during your free time when you weren't studying? Yeah, so I was one of those people that I was in the library all the time. Um, and so there was very little time that I spent doing other things. But I will say um, there there was a sporting plays range. And for those who are unaware, it's, it's kind of um, it's clay discs. And it's not just skeet shooting where they go out in front of you. You kind of walk to each of these different stations and they different things happen. And I it opened early in the morning and I could drive out there um, and shoot clay pigeons. And I found that to be incredibly relaxing um, and stress relieving. So um, I would do that. Um, and then I would also get together with a friend and um, watch football. But because I was such a nerd and studying so hard, um, we would TiVo or tape record the game um, and then fast forward through the commercial so we could watch it about half the time. So watching football and shooting play birds. I would have answered the, the football answer too. So. <laughs> But, you know, a really unique answer um, right there. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, and a sincere thank you to Zach for sharing your time with us. Um, we're grateful for your insights and perspectives. This has been really informative. Um, before I wrap things up for this evening, I do want to take a second and plug next week's episode. It will be hosted by my friends at Northwestern's chapter and will focus on climate change litigation for kids, um, specifically the Juliana versus United States case. Um, thank you very much for being here, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you.